Thank you, Miss Tammy. Our kids can be dismissed at this time for the Children's Chapel. You know what I love about that song, if you didn't catch it, is it's written from the standpoint of Christ. Christ has come there and he's talking with his disciples and he's giving them these instructions. And I love that it's goodbye is not the end. Are you thankful for that? The hope that we even have with our loved ones today that even though they will pass and depart from this earth, that in Christ, because of salvation, that goodbye is not the end. And Christ came and he gave his disciples that mission there, that you will go and tell the world about me. And that isn't some distant mission that he just gave them 2,000 years ago. That's our mission. Nothing has changed. It is still there. The same command and commission he gave them is the same one that we have today, to go forth and tell the world and to give them the only hope that exists in this world. Thank you, Miss Tammy, for that song. Turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Jeremiah, where we're going to be in. Uh, the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be uh, bouncing around in a few places today, but I think this is the perfect springboard text to uh, kick off our message, the book of Jeremiah there in the Old Testament, chapter number 9. We're going to look at just two verses, in uh, verse 23 and 24. Please stand with me if you are able to this morning out of the respect and the reading of God's Word. We love His Word here. We honor His Word. Uh, we are thankful this morning for the Bible and for God's Word. Again, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter number 9. The title again of our new sermon series that we're starting today is He Is. And this is a study on the attributes of God. Jeremiah chapter number 29, beginning in, ver excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off there. Chapter 9, I do that quite often. My wife just doesn't even notice it anymore. She just rolls with it. She goes, that's not right. Verse number 23 Thus saith the Lord. All right, God's speaking, so ears are perked up because this must be important, right? Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, verse 24, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Father, we are so thankful for your text this morning. Thank you for uh, giving uh, such sinful creatures a perfect book, Lord. That we can study you, that we can learn about you, that, that even if we've been believers for 60 years in our life, Lord, that we can still uh, grow uh, more vast in our knowledge of you. Father, I pray as we kick off this study today that through this you would work on our hearts. Lord, you would work on any preconceived notions or pride that we have in our hearts that we're dealing with, that we think we've arrived, that we think we uh, have, have known you to the fullest. Lord, I pray that today you would humble us as a child. And Lord, that you would reveal to us that we don't know you at all. Father, that today we would start to see you for who you are. And that through that and because of that, you will change our relationship with you forever. Lord, I thank you again for your holy words. I just pray that you'll use me this morning as a vessel for the next few moments to speak to your people. Your precious holy people whom you loved so much that you gave your life for us. We thank you we give you all the, the glory and the honor and the credit for it, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Who is God? Wow. What a question, right? Three words, three very small words, but as we look at that question in our lives, if someone asked that to you today and said, who is God? Where on earth would we even begin? How would we begin to describe them? And maybe someone would ask you that question this morning. How would you describe God? If someone knew you were a Christian, they knew you'd given your life to Christ, and maybe they wanted to know more, they would say, hey, give, give me this description, describe God for me. How, how do you even begin to describe the sovereign? How do we even begin to describe the founder and the creator of our universe? And I ask you this morning, do you know God? Do you even know him? See, it's easy for us to throw around, yeah, of course I know him. I know of some things, but no, 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 intimately, do you know him? Do you know his character? 
Do you know the attributes about God? Could, could you put together a presentation of just a few of these attributes that, that describe God? Do we know him at all? You see, knowing God is the very foundation of our Christian life. How can we say that we're Christians? How can we say that God has changed our life, but when push comes to shove, I don't know him? You say, is this even important? You're going to do a whole series on this, Pastor. 22 points we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. Why is this so important? Well, let me tell you why it's important for the non-believer, because if you don't know God and you never meet God in this life, you will spend an eternity in hell, and I don't want that for you. But I would say this to the Christians, this series is important to you because your walk with God will not progress if you do not grow in the knowledge of God. This is why in the Christian church today we can have those that have been saved for 30 and 40 years, but they're spiritual babies. They know nothing of doctrine. They know nothing of scripture. They know nothing of a closeness with God because they met God and then they've lived how they wanted to live. Let that never be said about us, in our families, in our lives. But this is almost how Christianity has become expected to be today. This is why you can go to a bookstore, maybe even a Christian bookstore today. And when you look at the books that are lining the shelf, you're going to see more books about self-help than you will see books that will tell you more about God and who he is and in his character. Now, if someone were to come to you today, and they were to ask you, you know, if someone was to come to to Brother David Mathers today, and said, "Uh, Brother David, would you describe yourself? Brother David would be able to describe himself. He'd say, I'm a great looking guy. I've got the best sense of humor. That's how I won my amazing wife. He would say, I'm stronger than anybody else at Faith Baptist Church. Look at me. I can pick up a whole chair, you know, in and of myself. And he would describe himself. And if someone came to you today and asked you the same question, Same question, you would be able to describe yourself. If someone came to you today and said, uh, uh, Brother David, would you describe your spouse for me? We would be able to do that. If someone came to me, I would say she's the best looking woman in the whole entire world. And I don't mean that to offend anyone else, but I've got the best looking lady. She's got the biggest heart I've ever met of anybody. She's funny. She's attractive. She's a great mom. I could go on all day, right? Same thing with our kids. Describe your kids to me, all right? Well, Marshall's kind of a knucklehead, but he's smart and he's growing and he's fast. We've been racing each other this week. And before long, at eight years old, he's going to be able to beat his old man here at racing. I could go do that with each one of my my kids. Why can we describe ourselves and describe our spouse and our kids to other people? It's because we know them. It's because we've invested in them. It's because we've taken the time to get to know the attributes of our spouse, to know the attributes of our children, to know the attributes of ourselves, because we know them and we know ourselves. But what about God? What about God this morning? During World War II in England, there was a a military base that was having a a tea luncheon for the officers and their wives that day. And uh, all of the the, the enlisted men and the other officers that were there, they were seated. And uh, there was a commanding general of the base who was coming in to give this big speech. And I guess he had meant to try to rally the troops, but uh, this guy just went on and on and on. People were falling asleep. Uh, People were fidgeting. They were just not interested in this uh, commanding general speech that seemed to never end. Well, there was a young lieutenant who was sitting in the crowd that day, and he was sitting at a table next to a woman that uh, he didn't know. But he leaned over, and he started grumbling to this woman. And he said, what a pompous and unbearable old windbag this slob is. He said, this guy will not shut up. Does he think he is entertaining people? He is putting us all to sleep. Well, the woman turned to him, and all of a sudden, her face went an instant shade of red. And she was not happy. And she said, "Uh, excuse me, Lieutenant, do you have any idea who I am? The Lieutenant, taken back for a moment, looked at her, and he said, well, no, ma'am, I do not. And she said, well, I'm the wife of the man who you just called an unbearable old windbag. Oh, So then the lieutenant gets in her face and says, well, ma'am, do you have any idea who I am? And she said, no. And he said, good. And he got up and ran out the door. (laughs) He didn't know the general like the wife knew this general, right? And how we view God 
will impact how we view everything else in our life. Let me say that again to you so that it hits home because it's absolutely the truth. How we view God will impact how you view every single other thing in your life. As a matter of fact, our very struggles and sins are rooted from having a wrong view of God. All the way back in the beginning, go back to the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve. And remember, Eve was walking in the garden, and she met a serpent, right? And we know that this serpent was Satan. And we know that Satan came and had a conversation with her. And if we just were to take a look at that conversation for just a moment this morning, notice what Satan didn't do. He didn't try to get Eve to question herself. Satan didn't try to get Eve to question her husband, Adam. Satan went after the fact that she needed to question God. Well, you can't really trust God. Well, he's a liar. Well, I know God told you this, but if you'll just eat from this tree and this fruit, here, you'll have all of the knowledge. You'll be, you'll be just as smart as God. As a matter of fact, you'll be a little God yourself. And that's how he came to Eve in the garden. And you know what? It worked, didn't it? It absolutely worked on her. You see, Satan knows the danger of having someone believe the correct and right things about God. And we should too. Because when we have a right understanding of God and who he is, it gives our faith a foundation to build upon. You see, when I know God and for who he is, when I know his attributes, when I know that he is good, when I know that he is trustworthy, when I know that he is faithful, the next time sin comes into my life, it doesn't wreck it quite as bad. When I know that God is loving, when I know that God is merciful, When I know that he is forgiving, the next time sin creeps up, the next time my world falls apart, I've got a little bit more of a foundation that I can stand on, amen? But when I'm all messed up and I've got wrong thoughts about God, my world crumbles every single time. As we go through this study over the next few weeks and we talk about these attributes of God, it's going to reveal three things to you and three things to me. The first one that it's going to reveal, obviously, is going to reveal the character of God. We're going to go through these 22 things, and surely there are hundreds more than that, but we're just going to touch on 22. But you're going to come away, and you're going to see God's character, who he really is, not who the world says he is, maybe not even who your favorite preacher says who he is, but what the Bible says that he is. The second thing it's going to reveal to you is your sin. You see, what you're going to find when we study the character of God is that he is perfect. He's holy. He's sinless. And because we look at every one of these attributes, you're going to see this, that I have none of those things. I am the exact opposite, that I am a sinful, fallen creature who cannot relate to God at all. But praise the Lord for the third thing that the attributes of God will reveal to us is it will reveal the glorious gospel. Because God knows that. God knows he is holy. God knows he is perfect. And God knows that you are not and that I am not. And so therefore, that's a problem. But thanks to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of Jesus, God has built that bridge in between God and man. And his attributes are going to reveal that to us through this study. Over the next several weeks, again, we're going to discuss 22 major attributes of God. And through these, we're going to see how vastly different God is from us, but also we're going to see the ways that we are called to be like him. You see, that's what's pretty cool about being a Christian, is now, through the Holy Spirit, I have the ability to be like God in some ways. I'll never be a God. would never want to be a God. We'll never be the God. But being a Christian, the very first term is to be Christ-like, and we are called to be in the likeness of him. And we'll also see this, that he can be known, that you can know him, that you can have a close relationship with God. You see, that's what sets Christianity apart from every other belief across the world. You see, if you talk about being a Muslim or you talk about being a Buddhist and they follow the teachings of those who led, but those were all men and they're dead and gone. There is not a modern-day Muslim on this, on this earth that, that has a relationship with Muhammad. There is not a, a, a modern-day Buddhist on this earth that has a relationship with Buddha. 
or Confucius or any of them because they're dead and they're gone. But even though Christ walked this earth 2,000 years ago, today you can have a personal, intimate relationship with him. What an attribute of Almighty God. And if we want to grow in grace... If you want to grow deeper in your relationship with him, if you say this morning, I want to be closer to God, I want to do greater things for him, then we must grow in our knowledge and our understanding of him. You'll never do great things for God just letting your Christianity go on idle. You'll never have this thriving, close, deep relationship, this intimate, personal relationship we talk about if you're not studying and you have no desire. My prayer for all of you that are here, whether you're here or you're tuning in online with us, is that through the duration of this study, is that you would know God more today than you did yesterday. And that it would be a desire of your heart to grow closer to him than ever before. And it has to be a desire. And we have to ask God to give us that desire because you can't just will this in and of yourself because I am ridden with sin, I am ridden with lust, I am ridden with selfishness. And the only way I'm going to have a desire to get out of myself and do great things for him is if God puts it in my heart. So before we get into our first attribute, and we're only going to do one today to kick it off. We've got to face ourselves with this very real question. And it's my first point this morning. Who is God? Who is God? Boy, there could be a thousand different answers, right? A thousand different explanations, and everyone's got a different take. But what does the Bible say? And we're just going to look at one passage on this uh, this morning, and there's a, a bunch we could spend on here. But I want you to just turn to Psalm 86 this morning. And I want you to grab your Bibles or your phones. Uh, this is not on your screen. I did that on purpose because I want you to not get lazy on me. We use our Bibles and we use our phones here. Psalm chapter 86. This is a, a prayer of David. Psalm chapter number 86, and when you get there, we're going to begin in verse 5, and I want you as we go through this, we're going to read verses 5 to 12, I want you, if you have a pen, I want you to circle the attributes that you see in just these seven verses uh, that we go through, because it's amazing how many David goes through in just this passage. When we're asking ourselves the question, who is God? Psalm chapter number 86, beginning in verse 5, he says this, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon me on thee give ear o lord unto my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications in the day of my trouble i will call upon thee for thou wilt answer me among the gods there is none like unto thee o lord neither are there any works like unto thy works all nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forever more. What a prayer. What credit that gives to God. And you know, God has given us a book today. I'm thankful that this isn't just something that we have to figure out on our own. And this isn't something that we have to come together in a giant brainstorming session. And well, what is God like? Well, well David, what do you think? Well, Wes, what do you think? Well, well, Jimmy, what do you think? Well, and we have to pawn that. It's already right here for us. God has given us a book a perfect book, an inerrant book, an infallible book, and it's called the Bible. And yes, the Bible contains many different characters within it. Yes, the Bible contains many different stories, but from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, this is a book about God. This is a book that consistently points us to Him and who He is. Amen. Are you with me today, or am I the only one in this building? We have a wonderful, perfect book. It is a love letter to us. It is a gift to us that we don't have to pull at straws, that we know who God is, but we got to get into it. I love what A.W. Tozer says. 
He says, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing to us. You see, every aspect of our lives is based upon our understanding of who God is. Who is he to you? Let me give you just a sad truth on this. The sad truth is we would expect the world doesn't know who he is. But the sad truth is that today, January 2023, all across our nation, all across our world, there are many that are sitting in church pews that do not even know who God is. You see, some people view God as a universal police officer. This is their view of him. That is just roaming the land, right? And he's looking to see who's disobeying. And he's looking to see who's, who's breaking the law, right? Because God never wants any of us to have fun. God's the biggest killjoy that there is. I mean, he's looking to see how many of you are going to live by the 600-some Levitical law. And man, the minute you don't, boom, he's going to give you the smackdown. There are those of us that believe that. That's how we view God. He's just this rule keeper. He's like the SS, right? The, the, or the Gestapo, the secret police that are just waiting for us to screw up. And the problem is those that believe this is that it ends up causing them to believe that God at his very core is not good. And that's not God. But then, on the flip side, there are others who view God as like a grandpa. Right? We view God as like this Santa Claus. He's got a big, long, white beard. He's probably got a jolly belly like your pastor does. And he just wants you to come sit on his lap and Give me your wish list, and man, tell me everything that you want for Christmas. We, uh, there are some that view him as being uh, kind to everyone, that he is not bothered by his sin, that God is always happy as long as we are trying to be our best self today, trying to just be the best human being that we possibly can. And let me say this to you this morning, that is not God either. And I'm thankful we don't have to figure this out on our own because the Bible paints us a far different picture in all of that of who God is. Let me tell you just a few. The Bible describes him from the very beginning as the creator and source from all things. This may not be news to you, but you didn't come from monkeys today. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that you didn't come from like a booger of slime that supposedly grew out of the green swamp and now we have Neanderthal people walking around here in Polk County today? Some of us look like that, right? But we know that that's not what happened. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm in there. He's the creator. He's the source of all of those things. The Bible says that he is declared as one God in three persons. We believe in the Holy Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, while different, are co-equal and are one. That is a triune God that cannot be matched and will never be matched. The Bible says that our God is not silent, he speaks. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? That God will speak to you, give you wisdom, give you guidance, answer your prayers. Our God says that he calls his own out of every nation, out of every tribe, out of every tongue. The Bible says that God's love is steadfast and sure. The Bible says that God is faithful to us even when we are not. The Bible says that he draws near to us. The Bible says that God wants a closeness with you even when you want to run away and be distant from him. The Bible says that he himself became a man in the form of Jesus Christ with the purpose of drawing near to us. He humbles himself without losing any of his holiness. He calls us to follow him. He dwells within us and empowers us to answer his call. The Bible says that our God is a working God. He's not a God that is asleep. He's not a God that is dead. He's not a God that gets tired and has to clock out and you've got to call the holy uh, hotline to get an appointment with him on a certain time and day. He is always working for you. And here's the one that I love. The Bible says that our God is a God who is coming again. That this isn't it. I'm thankful for that. There's no purgatory, there's no soul sleep. For the Christian, the best is yet to come. That is our God. And so here we are as Christians, 
Here we are as believers, right? Self-claimed uh, followers of Christ that have a testimony and, and come to church and serve him. And some of us go to Sunday school and some of us come on Wednesday nights and we work in VBS and do all of these things. And should that be our greatest desire? I would say no. They're good desires and every Christian should have those things. But I believe this, that the greatest desire for Christians should be to know him. To know God. I would say, I need to know him more. I need to know his scriptures deeper. That I'm not okay with where I'm at in my relationship with him. I believe our desire as Christians should be to do everything that we can to bring glory to his name. That we would seek to have hearts that beat his name and to be transformed by our very knowing of him. You see, the problem with Christianity today is our churches are filled with people who have supposedly gotten saved. Nothing should matter as much to me about being, about being close to my Father as I possibly can. So let's look at our first attribute. Again, we're just going to hit one today. But our first attribute of God is this. He is eternal. He is eternal. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation all the way to the back. And you don't have to hold your places. We're not coming back to any of these prior scriptures. Revelation chapter number one. One of my favorite books in all of scripture. Revelation chapter number one going to really help us drive this point home and describe for us how God is eternal. And we'll look at two verses here in chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1, and I want to direct you down to verse number 4. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him, catch this, which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now I want you to skip down to verse number eight. Right? This is Christ talking here. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I am so thankful this morning that we have a God who is the Alpha and the Omega. I'm so thankful this morning that we have a God who can proclaim to us that he is the beginning and the end. That we have a God that says, I have no beginning and I have no end. That's our God. Our God is not bound by time. As a matter of fact, he holds time in the palm of his hands. Try to wrap your brain around that for just a minute. That is weird. We serve a God that doesn't have an expiration date like your carton of milk that's in the refrigerator. We serve a God who can never be dead and gone. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And you know what's really cool is if you were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning this morning, the first three words of the Bible, you would read, in the beginning, right? But as we read scripture, we know this, that God existed long even before the world began. Man, that's weird. Off topic real quick. You ever stopped and wondered, what did God do before he created the earth? What did God do before he created the world? I have no idea. Maybe you thought I was going to come up with something brilliant there, but I have no idea. So we'll think about that. That's a great topic for discussion. When we look at people at this concept of being eternal, we struggle with this, right? Is anybody like me and you have just a hard time wrapping your mind and understanding the fact that God has no beginning and has no end? We struggle with this because we're not. We're the complete opposite. You see, every person in here, you have what is called, we call it the PD, we call it a DOB, a date of birth. Every one of you in here have a date of birth, and every one of you in here will have a date of death. We can't understand God's perspective of time because we only know this life's perspective of time. Everything we do is time. 
We know that there are 60 seconds in a minute. We know that there are 60 minutes in an hour. We know there are 24 hours in a day. We know that there are, are, are the 30 days in a month, some 31, um, some 28, right, if you go on a leap year. We know this, right? All we know is time, but God does not use time. He created time. It's in the palm of his hand. And you see, when we sit here even this morning and we talk about the attributes of God, we would say a few things and and say amen if you agree with me on this. Would you agree with me this morning that God is always good? Would you agree with me this morning that God is always loving? Would you agree with me this morning that God is always just? Yes, right? And maybe some of you, I would say most of you, have said that before, that that God is good all the time, all the time God is good. God is always loving, right? Did you know that if God was not eternal, you could never say always because it it would end. So the very fact that we acknowledge that God is always whatever it is, we are acknowledging this morning that God is eternal. But it's hard for us. Because all you can see and all I can see is the here and now, right? I can't go back and see my past any longer. I I certainly can't as much as some may try, right, with the fortune tellers and psychics. They can't see the future. We can't do that. We, in the midst of our, our difficulties and in the midst of our circumstances, how hard is it for, even, uh, for us to even fathom that God is working ahead of us in our future, right? Isn't that a difficult thing to even grasp? Because, see, when we look at our circumstances, and maybe you've gotten a, a terminal um, uh, uh, diagnosis, maybe you're looking at a financial collapse of yourself, maybe your family's falling apart, and we look at these circumstances in these situations, and we would say, it's hopeless. I don't see any way that this is going to work its way out. But did you know that what we see as hopeless, God, from an eternal perspective, is our hope? Because what we fail to realize is that while I'm dealing with that poopy diaper of my life right now, God's already way ahead of me, already fixing it. God's already way ahead of me, and he's got plans for me that I can't see, but I'm called to follow him and believe in him and trust in him that he's got the best plan for me. We don't know what our future holds, but there is an eternal God who is never caught off guard by any. And you can rest in that this morning. Because some of you are in here this morning and maybe your world is already rocked and nobody even knows what's going on. Didn't rock God. He's already working. He's already got things figured out. He's got the best plan for you. Some of us in here, something may come this week that devastates my life. Devastates my world. And while I'm scrambling and I can't even think and I'm not even thinking coherently and I can't put a plan in action, I don't have to worry about it because God already has done it. And he's working in my life because he's eternal. And we can have comfort in the fact today that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'll kind of give us a little snippet. We're not going to... world is changing. There are things in the church that is changing. I was listening to an old preacher talk one time. He said, he, he said, it drives me nuts because back in the day, all I had to do was go turn a knob on if I wanted to watch TV. Now I've got about 18 different remotes. I've got to hit power on this one, source on this one. It's a nightmare trying to even just watch TV. We live in that, and it is hard. I acknowledge it. There are things that, that I struggle with with that, but our God never changes. Always the same. And you can put money on that. What a comfort it is to know that because of an eternal God who has shed his blood for us, even though my body will die one day, even though your body will die, I'll live because of an eternal God. That's powerful. And the other neat thing that the Bible tells us is that God hasn't kept eternity to himself. He hasn't hasn't kept eternity as a secret. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this, that he has put eternity in our hearts. Let's take a look at that. Turn with me one more verse this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 3. 
Go back to the Old Testament of your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, chapter number 3, verse 11. All right, let's read this. I'll break it down for you. It says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world. And let's, let's discuss what that, that word, the world there, that, that word the world comes from the Hebrew word olam, O-L-A-M, olam. And it means this, eternity. So if we go through and we say that, also he hath set eternity in their heart. So that no man can find the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You know, we talked about how important it is that God was the creator and the source of all things. That means that he created you. Like it or love, love it, right? Or hate it. He created you. He created everything about you. He created your DNA. And so God put this characteristic from him into you. And that characteristic is that we were designed to follow things that would fulfill us for eternity. But when sin came into our hearts, all of that changed. And now, instead of seeking things that will fulfill me for eternity, instead of seeking that deeper relationship with God, instead of seeking to know the Scriptures more, we seek things that are only temporal. We look for things in this world to fill those voids in our life. That's why uh, we turn to sex. That's why we turn to things uh, like drunkenness and alcohol. That's why uh, we turn to things like food to help make me feel good when I'm depressed. This is why we turn to things like uh, seeking the approval of other people, right? Because if, if, as long as everybody can just like me and they approve of me, I'll, I'll be fulfilled. This is why we turn to things like uh, ha- having this, this body image that we have to keep, right? Because if I'm happy with myself and it, I'm just just got the self-esteem, then I'll be fulfilled, right? That's not what God designed for us. This is why some of us in this room turn to our Amazon Prime memberships. Because if I can just keep clicking add to cart, buy now, I'm going to feel better, right? That was not God's design for you and for me, church, amen? Those things will never satisfy you, and every one of us in here are living testaments of that today. Because we've tried those things. We've went the route of the world. We've went the route of trying to find fulfillment from people, trying to find fulfillment from uh, substances, or whatever it is in this life, materialism. And we always are ended up wanting more. It's because God didn't design you that way. And today your hearts will only be satisfied. You listen to me? Your hearts will only be satisfied by a God who is eternal. In Psalm chapter 90, and you don't have to go there, but it's a, it's a prayer from Moses. It's a really cool chapter to read. You'll study it sometime on your own. But Moses asks God just a bunch of really neat things, and, and I love Moses. He's, he's humble. I can't wait to meet him one day. But see, he comes there at the, towards the end of the chapter, and he asks a great request of God. And in Psalm chapter 90, he asked God, he said, God, would you teach us to number our days? Teach us to number our days. You see, the eternality of God should teach us to live out our days well. We know this, that we are all going to die one day. We know that we will not live on this earth in our life as we know it now forever. So therefore, we only have a certain number of days. And we don't know how many yet. Some of you in here, you may only have one day left. Some of us in here, we, we may have thousands of days left through years. But he's seeing this. He's saying, God, teach us to number our days. And what he's essentially asking God to teach him is this, to find his joy and satisfaction in God and not the world. He's saying, God, would you teach me that I'm not going to waste a bunch of my time on the things of this world. That, God, I'm not going to invest my days in the bulk therein, chasing things that don't really matter, chasing things that are temporary. God, would you give me a life that is fulfilled by you and things that are eternal? And it should teach us to seek God every day of our lives. Do we do that? 
are we seeking God every day of our lives? And I'm with you. If we can't answer that question as yes, then I'm telling you, we have not been taught to number our days. We have lost track of eternity. We have gotten focused on this world and the things that are in it. That let me tell you, when your life ends or the rapture comes, none of it mattered. None of it mattered. We're not going to be standing before God at the end of our life weeping because we didn't continue to work overtime so that we could have the, the grand house or the grand boat or the grand vacation We're not going to be standing before God at the end of our life weeping because I didn't get to be a VP at my company. We're not going to be standing before God weeping at the end of my life specifically because I didn't get asked to go preach a conference with 2,000 people sitting in the audience. Those things don't matter. But let me tell you what we're going to be weeping about. We're going to be weeping about the days and the months and the years and maybe even the decades for some of us that we wasted chasing the things of this world. All those open opportunities of lost people that have come into our life that we knew maybe. God, teach me to stop focusing on the things of this earth. But for most of us in here, and many times including your pastor, that doesn't include our life. That's not us. There's many times where I'll, we'll leave out of here Sunday, right, and we close this book, and it ain't getting opened again until the next week. Because I got work. I got bills to pay. I got kids to raise, right? I've got meals to cook. I've got homes to clean. I've got things to do. And there's going to be a lot of tears that are shed at the end of our life as we stand before God because we've misused our time. My prayer is that for some of you here, this clicks this morning. Because some of you here, if you're just being real with yourself, you're lost. You're not saved. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe it's been a tradition in your family, and your home growing up. Maybe for some of you, you you like to come to church, you like to be around God's people, it makes you feel good, but you have always wondered about it, and you've always been confused. Why isn't this clicking for me? That's why, because you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Some of you in here this morning, you're believers, you have a testimony, you know there was a time where your life was changed, you've given your life to Christ, you've repented your sin, but you're miserable this morning. You say, I have no joy. Joy from God departed my heart a long time ago. I'm struggling. And maybe, just maybe, this morning, God will reveal to you that the reason that you're miserable is because your priorities are all messed up. They're all backward. Because now, instead of chasing God and chasing the things that he loves and the things that glorify him, I've put me first. Or I've let the grief take over my life. Or I've let bitterness or anger control me, and it will absolutely control you. And then there are some of you here this morning that maybe you would just identify in this category and you would just say, I'm confused. I'm just confused. I know God. I've walked with him. I've, got these, I've seen him perform miracles in my life and in my family, but I've fallen into this sin or I'm struggling with this thing in my life and I'm just in this spiritual battle and I don't know which way to go. I don't know that I'm ready to give these things up, but I, don't know, I know that this isn't the right path to go. And some of you are just confused this morning. Church, what we must remember is that God holds every moment of your day in his hands. Imagine that. He's just holding you in his hands. Every second that clicks by on that clock, every time the minute hand changes on your phone, God's holding it in your hands. And let me say this, this is what makes Before there was even a person, before there was even a shape of the earth, before God even formed the mountains, he knew you. 
I love that, that Brother Kurt, he knocked it out of the park this morning in our growth group study. Because it's not like God just sat up there and said, well, if, if any of you just want to come to me, here you come. He called you by name. He knew you before you were even formed in the womb. And let me tell you what, that is humbling to me. And let me tell you why that's humbling. Because I know the sins of my heart. I know how disgusting this man is that is standing on the stage before you. I know how undesirable I am. I know that I have nothing to offer God. There are things that have happened and I have done in my life that none of you even know about in here. And I'd be eight beats of red if you did. I'd probably walk out and never come back. I'd be as red as Brother Catlin's shirt. And we all have that in our lives. But you know what humbles me? is knowing my sin, knowing my depravity, knowing that, 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 that I have nothing to offer God, I don't deserve anything. God knew all that too. And he looked upon that and he said, I love you. And I want you, and I want you so bad that I'm going to give my life for you. Even knowing our deepest, darkest secrets, some that may even make your spouse depart from you. It never changed the mind of God. You were worth it to him. You were worth the cross. But you must come to him today. You must repent of your sin. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I ask you one final time this morning, who is God to you? Is he the policeman? Is he the Santa Claus? Is he the grandpa? Is he the angry judge that sits up there with the huge gavel? Is he he your mom? Is he your dad? Who is God to you? Do you know him this morning? Have you repented of your sin? Have you? I'm not worried about your spouse. I'm not worried about your children. I'm asking you this morning. Have you repented of your sin and believed upon him? Have you confessed him? as Lord of your life. Without that, you have no hope. Without that, oh, you'll live eternally. We all have eternal life. But based on that decision in your life, you'll be spending eternity with him in heaven or you'll be spending eternity in hell, in damnation, forever and ever. Oh, lost sinner, be saved today. Today. Don't wait till tonight. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next Christmas because you want to make a big family announcement. Don't wait. The Bible says that this day is the day of salvation. Know Christ today. I'm not a gambling man. I'm not willing to gamble my life, right? Because if I'm gambling on my life, I don't, I don't usually don't have any good odds anyways, right? Going out there, I don't have a promise that my life's even going to extend beyond the end of this service today. Church, did you know this? People actually die in church. Have you ever heard of that? We seem to come in here and think we're in some kind of a safe bubble, and that is not true. There have been people that have had cardiac arrest in the middle of a service. There have been church shootings, which is why we have safety people to help us out with this. We're not even guaranteed to leave this building today. Why would you gamble with your soul? The work has been done. Give your life to Christ For the Christians in here, how are you numbering your days? Are you living for him? Or have you gotten so off course? Have your priorities gotten so mixed up? You've totally lost the path of your life. Let today be a day that we confess our sins before a God who is eternal. And you know the wonderful thing? We get a blessing even just for confessing our sins. Because for the Christians, as we come here and confess our sins, you know what? We get forgiven just as you did the moment you were saved. And I get a peace in my life. And I think many of us are missing that peace. But it's there. You can have it. But let's give those things to Christ today. He is eternal. And because of that, because of his son, because of his blood, because of the cross, you can live. Show many things that we can't grasp, but this is not one of them. 
And Lord, while I can't maybe able to uh, fully explain uh, the God who is, has no beginning and the God that has no end, Lord, I believe it. Lord, I believe that through your Son and through the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you've given me eternal life, that I will be living with you in heaven for all eternity. And Lord, I pray this morning, if there be anybody here who does not know that, who may be struggling with that, who may be here and would say, I, I don't know if Jesus is my Savior. I can't remember. I mean, I've asked for forgiveness, but I don't know if I meant it in my heart of hearts. I just, I really have questions about my salvation today. Lord, that today would be the day that they would seek answers for that. First from you. Lord, that you would give them the words in prayer to confess their sin, to meet you for the very first time. But Lord, they would not leave this building today without making their calling. and Father, I thank you for the Christians that are in here, but Lord, we how many of us have gotten our priorities mixed up and we're so focused on the things of this world? Lord, I pray that today would be the day that we get things right, that we get things straight, that we put you first and foremost in our life and that it stops just being talk, that it stops just being what sounds good and what makes everybody think well of me, that it actually, even in my thought life, Lord, that you become first and foremost. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work and minister to our hearts now as we turn this over to you, Father. I pray that we're all changed. I pray that we're all pricked by these things this morning, Lord, that you'll help us fill the voids in our life that we've been trying to fill everywhere else. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things.